So welcome everybody to our event for International Women's Day on Women Open Water Swimming. And this has been um, founded by the UCL Institute for Women's Health, where I am a professor of reproductive science. And we have been running five events for International Women's Day, which we would normally do at University College London, where we all work. But obviously we're now doing it on Zoom, <laughs> another Zoom. But the Institute um, has the aims of making a difference to women's and babies' health. And with this International Women's Day, it's an absolute pleasure to talk about women open water swimming. And I'm quite new to winter swimming. I'm one of these people that could never go past water without wanting to jump in it. Um, and so with lockdown and all the problems that happened, um, I'm one of the many quite newbies to open water swimming, to, to winter, winter open water swimming, but it is so addictive and um, so exciting. I'm now going four times a week <laughs> um, and really just, it's, it's such a bug, but it's not a simple thing. It is something that I think you need to read up on and think about very carefully. So this is why I thought it was really important today to gather some of the UK's leading experts in open water swimming who are going to give us some really useful information. But before we start, I just want to run a short poll to ask a little bit about you. So I hope you can see that now. So I just want to know, uh, th this is all anonymous, just how old you are and have you done any open water swimming? Just so we can get a bit of a feel for the audience that we're dealing with. I do have a feeling that more men cycle and more women open water swim. <laughs> so it's, it's one of those interesting things. I've met so many women. There are lots of men. There were lots of men swimming yesterday in Cambridge. So we've got a few more. We've got 86% voted so far. I'll give you another few seconds. Are we almost all done? Anyone else want to fill in the poll? It's just a bit of fun while we're just waiting for those people to last few people to join us. Excellent, right, I'll stop it there and share that with you. So this is something else that I'm very aware of. The majority of people listening now, 67% were 46, are 46 years and over. And sorry, my mouse is playing up a bit today. Have you ever done any open water swimming? So 63% have done, have said yes, a lot. 32% said yes, a bit. Very technical terms I thought we'd use for this poll. Um, and 4% said no, but I'm thinking about it. And 1% said no. So that was really great. So thank you so much for completing that. So our panel today, we've got Sasha, Heather, Ruth, Ruth, Rachel, and Jessica, and they're all going to cover different aspects of open water swimming. I'm just going to stop sharing so that I can make that a bit easier. So without any further ado, we're going to get started. Now, can I just say, the meeting is a um, is set up as a meeting, so we just ask anyone who's not speaking. So only the panel will be speaking to start with. So if everyone else could just uh, mute themselves, and you're, it's okay if you want to keep your camera on. It's quite nice for the speakers to see some faces, <laughs> and that they're not just talking to a, a blank computer screen. Uh, so we're going to start with uh, Professor Sasha Rosneal. And she also works at University College London, but we've never actually met. So I'm looking forward to us meeting properly when we actually go back to work. And Sasha is Pro Vice Provost for Equality and Inclusion. She is Dean of the Faculty of Social and Historical Sciences and Professor of Interdisciplinary Social Science. That's a very long title, Sasha, <laughs> but very well earned. So Sasha is going to start with an introduction to open water swimming. So I'll hand over to Sasha. She's got some slides that she's going to show. No, oh, no slides. Sasha wasn't there. No, Sasha, yeah. Sasha, sorry. Sasha's the one with no slides. I'll be quiet. Sasha, over to you. Thank you very much, Joyce. What an exciting evening. Um, this is a really momentous occasion. 
Um, we, we were sold out, um, uh, but up against the salacious royal gossip temptations of the Meghan and Harry interview, we've all chosen uh, 90 minutes of talking about open water swimming. Open water swimmers don't choose the easy populist option. We don't swim with the crowd. We don't settle down in front of the telly to goggle at the latest scandal although we might watch it later on catch up. Risking the conceit of thinking I know a little about how we see ourselves. We do our own thing. We're adventurers, individualists, we go our own way. Yet there are paradoxically a lot of us these days, adventuring individualists going our own way. My contribution this evening as a sociologist of contemporary social change and a passionate open water swimmer is to offer you some reflections on this phenomenon and why it matters to so many of us and potentially to our collective future. Uh, there are about 190 of us and rising gathered here on Zoom on this International Women's Day evening to think together about women and open water swimming. In three days time, it will be one year since the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a pandemic. I want to suggest that there's an important connection between these two events. The scale of the interest, the huge upsurge of interest in open water swimming, particularly amongst women over the past year, is directly related to the pandemic and the enormous change that this global crisis of health has thrust upon us all. But I also think it speaks to longer term, even more profound change in our collective conditions of existence, changes of which we're increasingly consciously aware, but with which open water swimming puts us subliminally in contact in a visceral embodied way. Open water swimming, and especially open water swimming for women, has some of the characteristics of a social movement. Social movements are collective psychosocial phenomena. They speak back to the psychosocial conditions of their time. They're shaped by and reflect these conditions, and they're an agentic collective attempt to seize control of these conditions, to change them for the better. They mobilize our emotions, our passions, as well as articulating a vision of a better world. In recent times, there appears to have been a groundswell, a rapid, spontaneous growth in open water swimming, or wild swimming as it's often called, with a heightened speed and intensity of growth during 2020. Although there have been a small number of passionate advocates of open water swimming, writing books and blogs and the occasional article for many years, it's only more recently that journalists have really cottoned on and have started publishing dozens of features about open water swimming in the mainstream media. Every few days, Google's algorithms, who know me all too well, inform me of yet another article from somewhere in the world extolling the virtues and pleasures of open water swimming. I can barely keep up. Indeed, at times, there have been so many, I've almost been on the verge of being put off this craze. After all, I'm an adventurer, an individualist. I do my own thing. But more generously to those who are newly discovering my longstanding passion, this publicity has rightly identified the growth of open water swimming and has served to amplify its popularity, encouraging more people to give it a go, breaking down some of the many barriers, social, cultural and psychological, that pre prevent people from swimming in open water. Writers, journalists, photographers and filmmakers have been drawing the attention of wider publics to this previously rather obscure and recherche pastime once the prerogative of, on the one hand, bohemians and drunken students who launch themselves naked into the can from bucolic dew-sprinkled summer meadows, and on the other hand, hardcore triathletes in neoprene churning madly through the icy waters of a lake in a dense, rather frightening crowd of overtrained athletic bodies. These cultural commentators have spotted an emergent trend, and casting their gaze on those who are already doing it and who are loving it, they've made open water swimming more imaginable more accessible to people, and perhaps especially women, who might never have thought that they could swim outdoors in rivers, lakes, reservoirs or sea at any time of the year, in any weather, and without always having explicit authorization and organization. It's been a year, unprecedented within our lifetimes, of limitations on individual liberty. There have been variously and repeatedly locked down. We've been locked down, confined within our homes, our localities, our national borders, restricted in our ability to travel, to socialise, to do as we please. However much consciously, intellectually, rationally, politically, we might accept and understand the necessity of these interventions as public health measures for the collective good, at some level we're all, I suspect, yearning for the everyday ability to do as we please, to spontaneously pop round to a friend or neighbour's house for a coffee, or to the local pub for a drink, or to take that trip further afield, 
planned months in advance, but now cancelled. The previously taken for granted liberties of ordinary life are in abeyance. There's a sense of life being suspended as the days and weeks tick by. Moreover, we've all had to learn very suddenly and very fast that physical closeness, touch, the proximity of human bodies, and above all, the sharing of air with others is potentially dangerous. Now for far too many women, to, for too many people, women especially, this isn't a new revelation. Experiences of violence and intimate violation have left traumatic legacies for far more people than has historically been acknowledged. But for physical closeness, touch, proximity of human bodies and the sharing of air to be publicly known and stated as dangerous, and for there to be government edicts against them is new in our lifetimes. We've had to engage as individuals and as a global society in a mass sensual recalibration, a relearning of instinctive bodily habitation, spacing ourselves out, developing an acute awareness of our physical boundaries and of incursions into the protective shield of social distance. For those of us lucky enough to be confined to our homes rather than working on the front line of healthcare, transportation and the provision of essential services, Lives previously lived in three dimensions have been flattened and boxed into a computer screen as we spend our days in a seamlessly, seemingly endless cycle of video calls with distant colleagues, students, clients, friends and family. And for those with family responsibilities, especially, of course, women, all this with children at home and out of school for months on end, needing care and attention in a whole range of ways and elderly relatives and loved ones with health conditions sequestered by law out of bounds. Against this backdrop of regulations and restrictions, it makes perfect sense that thousands more people, and especially women, have been discovering open water swimming. Because open water swimming is a practice of freedom. Entering any body of water and moving through it, propelled by your own energy, finding the pattern of breath that maintains the rhythm of arms and legs working in harmony, is to experience an alternative dimension of human agency released from contact with the ground and the quotidian reality of earthbound movement. The sensation of being immersed in water, its soothing smoothness, the lack of resistance as you feel your body's power and potential, no longer tied down or held back, weightless but strong, there is freedom in swimming, especially perhaps for those of us who've never found pleasure as others do in running, or for those of us whose bodies haven't been coded as and haven't succe succeeded to be conventionally athletic. But how much more so when you swim outside, when there's no roof above you, when there are no walls around you, no steamy windows, no shouty echoey voices, no high pitched screams, no bombing children, no pervasive smell of chlorine hanging in the warm air, reminding you of the danger of human contagion, of the need to keep germs and viruses at bay. Outdoors, it's altogether quieter and the air is safe to breathe, free from aerosol transmission of coronavirus, and then how much more freedom still when you swim in open water without the monotony of 25 or 50 meter turn and return. The water stretches ahead with no hard end, no brick wall. When there are no lane dividers hemming you in, no lines on the bottom keeping you on the straight and narrow. When you can swim queerly, finding your own route at whatever strange angle pleases you. When there is real space between you and your fellow swimmers and no stress about matching your pace with a label at the end of the lane, when there is no lane rage. No need to make a snap decision. Am I slow, medium or fast today in this pool at this time of day? Who else is swimming? How do I compare? No need to obsess about whether I'm annoying those coming up behind me. You might have noticed I'm talking in the first person now. I'll own these less than honorable thoughts. Why are these dawdlers cluttering up my lane? Why is that couple treating the Lido as if it were their love nest? Why has that man put on a huge spurt in order to barge aggressively past me only to stop exhausted at the end of the lane for five minutes? Why do those two women think they can swim with their heads out of the water, chatting with each other, taking up the whole width of the lane? And why, oh why, do people stand at the end gazing around like they were propping up the bar at their local? In open water, I'm free from such despicable misanthropic thinking, free to be my better self, free to focus on my breath, my stroke, my movement, able to let go of the troubles, the anger, the stress, the worries with which I entered the water and which can attach potentially to anybody who enters my line of sight or gets in my way. In open water, I can just be in the moment, in my body, in the water, 
mind calmed by body and water, control over disturbing unruly thoughts and feelings brought back with an active grasp. Yet this powerful practice of personal freedom is also a training in adaptation and an education in relationality. We might be free to swim in the open water and it might fill us with a sense of freedom, but we can't choose the temperature of the water into which we dive or the air into which we emerge afterwards. The wind, the weather, the waves are not within our control. We note them, we accept them, or we stay home. As the days shorten and the temperatures falls, we adjust. The time of day at which we swim has to change, how long we're in the water, how far we swim. But as novice open water swimmers, we learn that we can and do adjust. Miraculously, we can tolerate and even enjoy the colder water. Indeed, it can be more exhilarating, more energizing, more exciting than warmer water swimming. Swimming in the rain is glorious. When there is snow on the ground, it's magical. Swimming open water day in, day out as the seasons change puts us in touch with the natural world and our place in it. The gannets that dive into the water ahead of us, the mallards that swim alongside us, the heron that watches loftily from the bank remind us that we're sharing their habitat. The weeds that brush our legs, the fish we see beneath the surface in glittery shoals, the seaweedy smell of the ocean, the earthy, watery smell of reeds and weeds in river, reservoir or lake catch our awareness and offer us fleeting sensations of connectedness with other species. And then there are the plastic bottles, the plastic bags, the food wrappers, the detritus of human existence that we encounter if we swim in the sea and sometimes in rivers and lakes. And we're forced to think about the other darker side of our cohabitation of the planet with the plants, the birds and the fish the destruction that we're wreaking. And we might reflect on the unseasonably warm water in October and November, the monsoon-like rains that we don't remember from our childhood, the chemical runoff that flows into the rivers and lakes. And so it is that the planetary transformations that human beings are enacting on other species and on the environment, climate change, microplastic pollution, changes in the composition of the oceans, the toxicity of the water through which we're swimming, come into consciousness. As much as open water swimming is a pleasurable, sensual way of encountering, extending and practicing our agency and potency as bounded, embodied individuals, it's also a mode of experiencing our fundamental relationality, our entanglement with the natural world around us, our dependence upon it and the need to care for it. If open water swimming is a social movement, a movement of people, particularly women, yearning for and finding a different, freer way of being in their bodies and living our lives, and different ways of relating to the environment and to other species. It's a movement of which I am a member. Yet the wondrous thing is there is no membership fee, no organization to join. Anyone, all of us can just dive, jump, slide or tiptoe in and be part of the change. That's absolutely wonderful, Sasha. I, my kids have been asking me to explain to them why I'm doing it because they think I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only mother whose kids think they're mad. And I think I'm just going to play them what you've just said um, because you've talked about the um, positives, but also the negatives. So, I mean, that, that's absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much, Sasha. And we'll, we'll have many questions, I'm sure, for you, you know, in, at the end. So wonderful, people are putting wonderful in, in, in the chat now. Um, and if anyone's got any questions, then please start putting them in the chat so we can start uh, thinking about when we're going to, um, what we're going to ask. So uh, now a great pleasure to hand over to Dr. Ruth Williamson. Ruth is a radiologist and deputy chief medical officer at University Hospitals in Dorset. She's a channel relay and winter swimmer, and she has research interests in, sorry, sorry, my script's just gone. <laughs> uh, you've caught me out now. Uh, she has research interest in the health benefits and risk management of cold water swimming. And Ruth is going to tell us about some tips on, safe, on swimming safely in the open water. So Ruth. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Sasha, for what beautiful poetry uh, talking about open water swimming. And thank you for inviting me. Um, this talk is really for that small group of people who said that they haven't swum in open water before uh, uh, or are thinking about it, because I can see that I'm really talking to experts. And one of the challenges around a talk like this is knowing who's going to be in the room 
uh, when you get there. So for most of you, I'm telling you how to suck eggs, but for a few of you, hopefully, I'll tell you some things which will help you to swim as safely as possible. And this is the bit where my slides um, are going to work for me. So um, the, first, the first rule of open water swimming, and I learned this on a channel swim training camp, was don't die. Um, the good news is, as women, we are much less likely to die uh, open water swimming than anyone else. And in fact, you're much less likely to die from drowning um, by deliberately swimming than you are by walking or running next to water or uh, entering the water unexpectedly from watercraft. So actually, you know, no, no, one, no one wants to drown, but uh, being a woman deliberately swimming is actually a very low risk activity. And I think that's important to start off. Open water swimming is a safe activity. I do want to talk about the risks though. And um, one of the biggest risks, if you've grown up uh, swimming in swimming pools is the difference between the temperature of a swimming pool, which is 28, 29 degrees and cold water. Now we don't all swim in water as cold as Kate does, uh, but in, the, in June, the water temperature is about 12 or 13 degrees, which is colder than a cold shower. And in the summer, in the peak of the summer, it's 17 or 18 degrees. Um, and that's about the temperature of a cold shower in your house. So um, there is a certain, certainly a temperature difference from what you're used to. And this is a real area of interest for me. And, and there are different aspects to uh, the risks of cold water. The first is cold shock. And many of you will probably have heard of the um, float to survive um, initiative from the RNLI and that's about the fact that when you first get into cold water it's very difficult to control your breathing and uh, those of us that swim in very cold water always talk about getting control of the breath and using the breath. Um, that's your first challenge when you get into colder water. The second one is as your muscles cool they become less effective and um, eventually the muscles will, will cease to function and you can develop swim failure. And then actually considerably after that, um, there is the challenge of hypothermia. And for outdoor swimmers, this is really important because your temperature continues to go down after you get out of the water. My little coloured squiggles here are part of a study I did last year um, at the uh, International Ice Swimming Association UK Championships, where we took the temperature of people, uh, got them all to swim a kilometre in cold water and then measured their temperature afterwards. And what you can see is that some swimmers were able to raise their body temperature. Most swimmers came out colder than when they went in and a few people got below this red line of 35 degrees core temperature. So a couple of swimmers became clinically hypothermic. Now these swimmers were absolutely fine, but it is just worth realizing that not only did they become hypothermic when they got out, but they continued to cool for 15 minutes and they hadn't even recovered to above hypothermia until 40 minutes were up. So you can be cold for quite a long time after you've got out of water. Uh, and that's really important to know. So, the most important tip, my first tip for you, is to make sure that you dress appropriately when you get out of the water. So this is me after a series of open water swims at Guildford, where we swam for an hour on the hour, every hour for 12 hours in water that's about 15 degrees. And uh, you can see my Shack Sharks hoodie and you can see my scarf and my hat and my thermal leggings and my fake goose down jacket and my dry robe and then underneath that I've got a thermal vest and a t-shirt and a vest top and I've probably got a, a hot water bottle tucked in my tummy as well so and this wasn't particularly cold water but it's really important when you get out of the water get dressed quick and wear an implausibly large amount of clothes and you will be happy and smiley like that. The reason that uh, people tolerate this kind of North Norway swimming is that the body does adapt and the best way to adapt 
um, is by swimming regularly. Uh, so little and often is a good way. This is uh, some imaging, because I'm a radiologist, of the way that the body develops its brown fat, uh, which it increases as you cold acclimatize. The next thing I wanted to talk about water was the fact that water comes in many varieties in open water. So this was my very first open water swim at a lake in Eastleigh. Uh, it's a really small lake, it's lifeguarded, it's safe. It was full of triathletes uh, going round and round and jumping over you, but a very safe and easy environment in which to swim. Um, this is a mate of mine who was swimming in the channel and the water was pretty much like that when she started. But by the time her swim was aborted, uh, you can see that it was significantly more challenging to swim in and, and became unswimmable. And, and so my ne next tip is, um, whatever water you're in, think about not only how you're gonna get in, but also how you're going to get out. Because as I learned early in my swimming career, getting out when it's big and wavy is often much harder than it is getting in. So we always talk about making really good decisions out of the water before you get in the water. And one of those is whether or not to get in and two, being sure that you can get out before you get in. Um, once you've got in the water, there's a few joys and pleasures for you to meet. Um, and I'll just mention a few of the ones which I think are important. So E. coli and other bugs, you find these everywhere. Um, both in the sea and in fresh water. And that's often after heavy rain. And I certainly think very carefully about when and where I'm going to swim if it's been raining heavily, which it seems to have done for months and months and months. If like me, you are a contact lens wearer, then there is a particular bug called acanthamoeba, which is one that can damage the uh, cornea, the surface of your eye. And if you go to an optometrist or an optician, they'll tell you that you mustn't swim wearing contact lenses. But if you go to Moorfields Eye Hospital, they will say you can swim wearing contact lenses. And frankly, I can't see if I'm not wearing contact lenses. And I haven't been able to find a pair of prescription goggles that, that fit well enough to swim. Uh, they, they say you can swim and they give some really good advice on their website about how to swim with contact lenses and how to keep your eyes safe. The next thing that we encounter um, are the things that sting, the envenomers. And the two that I've met most frequently are jellyfish and weaver fish. And in Europe, um, the good news is that the treatment for these is pretty much the same. So get yourself away from the thing that stung you. Weaver fish lurk in the sand and uh, jellyfish lurk in the sea. Get, your, get yourself out of the water and then apply heat. So anything as hot as you can uh, tolerate will, um, uh, will deactivate the toxins. And it works incredibly well. I remember treading on a weaver fish and being able to go to a friend's house where she put very, very hot water in the bath and I dunked my foot and it recovered incredibly quickly. The other two hazards are um, our very favorite jet skis, uh, which, uh, move at great speed and not always with the same perception of uh, swimmers in the water that we have. And so um, one needs to be cautious if they're around. And if I see jet, uh, there, there are jet skis out, I will wear a tow float to, to make myself as visible as possible. And then finally, uh, we need to talk about sunshine. I know in the UK we don't see very much of it, but um, it is there and you do not perceive the sun burning you when you're swimming in open water. And you can all see that I am a very fair skinned white woman and I have got sunburn in March um, by just not appreciating that the sun uh, will damage my skin at any time of year. Um, so wear sunscreen. Uh, the plus side is that you get loads of vitamin D and I'm pretty proud that most years I've got a swimmer's cross on my back throughout the year. Not this year because of lockdown, but mostly I do, just a bit of gentle tan, but I do wear sunscreen and it's really important, particularly if you're fair skinned like me, that you do that, uh, even when it's not particularly sunny. My next tip uh, is to use the power of the people with whom, you know, the swimming community. This is 
once I graduated from the lake, I joined this group of Durley Sea Swims. They uh, swim in Bournemouth. They had a Facebook page and I happened across them. What I didn't know, I just thought they were an open swimming group, but it turned out that they were all training to swim the channel. And so accidentally, I found myself a couple of years after joining the group, jumping off the channel, the boat in the middle of the channel at three o'clock in the morning as part of a channel relay. So you kind of had to be careful of your company because you may find yourself doing crazy stuff, which for someone who a couple of years earlier was a sort of 20 lengths in the local pool breaststroker, uh, it was quite a big journey, but one that I've absolutely embraced. So yeah, learn from those around you. Um, I reckon that most open water swimmers are a generous bunch. Uh, most of what I've learned has been from these people, either what's what they told me, where what they've done, uh, or what's happened to them and what I've then researched and learned from them. Some of them have also participated in my research and uh, anyone who's interested in their core temperature, uh, come and see me in my special probe. My, my last tip though is um, to remember that you are you and that we're all individuals and that you should always swim your own swim. So it may be that, you know, you're swimming next to your mate. This is uh, my mate, Deborah, who was training to swim the channel at the time. It wasn't that warm and I quite happily wore a wetsuit. If you need to wear a wetsuit to be warm, to enjoy your swim, wear a wetsuit. If you want to get in the water on Christmas day um, without a wetsuit on, that's absolutely fine. If you want to wear a toe float to be better seen, that's great. It's your swim, do it your way and, and don't be pressured to get in the water when others do, to get out of the water when others do, or to dress in the way that others do. Um, I love open water swimming. I love the fact that it's a great leveler, that it doesn't matter what shape or size you are, um, you can't tell how well someone can swim till they get in the water. And then all you can see is a swim cap and some arms. So uh, that's really all I wanted to say. Um, here are some resources. These are all the Google searches I did to get to exactly the page that you would, that you would want. Uh, and these are just lots of people who will help you on your swimming journey. So thanks very much, everyone. Ruth, that was, that was amazing. I'm sure that even those people that tick that they do a lot of open water swimming would have learned something there. I, I, I've, realize there's so much to learn. And for me over lockdown, it's been a real pleasure to read and watch videos and listen to blogs and things um, to learn about this. It's uh, something that's given me a great way to occupy myself. Um, and um, I, I think the community I've met, they've not pressurized people into, you know, everyone should be in skins or whatever. Today, I know my friend Becky's on, she, she goes in skins and I go in a wetsuit and everyone's always uh, very accommodating to her, however anyone wants to swim and you really you've really given us really key information and I I agree that Facebook has a lot of resources out there there's so many great swimming groups and I'm sure people will find a local group so um, I've joined several local groups and um, we mentioned before we, we officially started there's a, a national group for women called uh, the Blue Tits um, and we have a Cambridgeshire branch and it's, it's just been really phenomenal to meet other like-minded women who will partner, partner up with you and um, go swimming. So that's really brilliant. So if you've got any questions for Ruth, please um, put them in the chat and we'll move on now to Heather. I'll just get my notes. So I've listened to several of Heather's uh, webinars. She's done some really amazing um, uh, webinars and things that are on Facebook and uh, YouTube and various places. So Heather, Dr. Heather Macy is from the University of Portsmouth. She's a channel swimmer and an ice 1K swimmer. Hats off to you oh. for that. Uh, and currently researching the physiology of cold water swimming and its impact on physical and mental health. And so Heather is going to tell us a little bit about the health benefits. So Heather, pleasure to hand over to you. Are you doing okay there? Do I need to order this for you? you we've, we've, got your, we've got your slides up, but we, we can't see... It's come up as Jan Halliday. Have we lost Heather? 
Heather, you're still muted. Thank you. Hello, is that better? Oh, perfect. There you are. <laughs> good. Yeah. I didn't good know what you. happened there. I do apologise. No, no, we had one of those Zoom link things that go a bit weird, but that's fine. Brilliant. Good to see you, Heather. Thank you very much, Joyce, and thank you for the introduction there. Um, today, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to be talking about the balancing act that we all do as open water swimmers. So Ruth very eloquently talked about the potential for, for harm that we can have uh, as an open water swimmer. And I'm going to focus more on the potential benefits that outdoor swimming uh, may have. So as a scientist, I like to look at the scientific evidence. And currently, as it stands, the scientific evidence is slightly skewed towards the potential harms that outdoor swimming or immersion in cold water can have. And that's primarily because we've focused as a scientific group on the potential for harm. Uh, and we see here when we look at this information that the more stars there are associated with the with the phrase, the stronger or the higher quality of evidence and the uh, fewer stars, the more experiential or anecdotal that evidence is. And we tend to see more experiential evidence around the potential benefits for immersion in cold water or cold water swimming. Now that's probably because there's far less research in the area. And we've noticed over time that obviously there's been a big increase in the experiential evidence of open water swimming having some positive impact. And these uh, particular books uh, have really spearheaded the way ahead to provide that experiential evidence. And as Sasha mentioned, we've had a large amount of media interest, particularly over the last year. We've also seen a large increase in the number of outdoor swimmers in the last year. And Outdoor Swimmer magazine now reckons we have over 1 million regular outdoor swimmers in the UK. So that's a huge increase, uh, probably because of the lockdown and pandemic, meaning that limited uh, travel opportunities. But we've also noticed that outdoor swimming has been increasing in popularity for a number of years, but spiked in the last year. Now, just prior to lockdown, we undertook a survey looking at asking outdoor swimmers about the impact that outdoor swimming has had on their health in comparison to having no impact. And for every one person who swam outdoors who had no impact, we found just over three people had had a general positive experience in their general health. And for every one person with no impact, we found 44 people had had a positive impact on their mental health. So we're starting to accumulate this experiential evidence. And what we need to do is start to develop the higher quality evidence uh, to uh, propose outdoor swimming as a potential therapeutic effect. So what other evidence, what other experiential evidence do we have? Well, we know of uh, changes or reductions in blood pressure, in long-term changes in blood pressure as a consequence of swimming outside. People have noted changes to pain, noted uh, changes in endocrine function, particularly for uh, women uh, with uh, menopausal uh, conditions. They've found reductions in um, uh, hot flush responses as a consequence of outdoor swimming. We've seen uh, people with migraine have fewer symptoms and suggestions that there's changes in immune function and the number of colds people have. Now we know from recent research that outdoor swimmers have similar numbers of, numbers of colds to pool swimmers, but they do far less activity. And the outdoor swimmers tend to have fewer colds than people they cohabit with. Now, most recently in the media and headlines, we've, uh, we've heard a lot about mental health and outdoor swimming and neural degeneration and outdoor swimming. So this is where I'm going to focus this talk. So in terms of mental health and well-being, we know from the scientific evidence that just being close to water, not in it, has an impact, a positive impact on our well-being. And actually just looking at pictures of nature, either on a screen or in, in, uh, on a wall, can actually improve that well-being as well. We know activities outside in nature also improve mental health and as does exercise. We know from swim along interviews that outdoor swimmers feel more connected with nature. 
They feel transformed in terms of their body and identity, and they feel reorientated or reset as a consequence of their swim. So what about the potential for therapeutic effect? Well, we know of a case study where uh, the uh, case was able to reduce their medication and come off their medication for depression because of starting to outdoor swim. And when this case study was complete, had been off their medication for 18 months. So that's one person, but what about more people? Well, since then, we've undertaken some research with novice outdoor swimmers and also people that were watching on the beach during their swimming program. And we looked at indices of mood, uh, noted by the positive and negative changes here, and well-being. And in the swimming population, it, just after one swimming session, we see large increases in positive mood. And we see reductions in negative mood. So that post-swim high is in operation. We also see longer term changes in reductions in negative mood states and improve well-being in just nearly 70% of our swimming population. Now, the beach watchers also had some improvement in well-being, but not to the same extent. Now, we do have more ongoing research at the moment in people living with symptoms of depression and anxiety. But please watch this space. We haven't finished that work, so we'll talk about it when we have. So another thing that's been in the uh, media quite recently was looking at outdoor swimming or wa water immersion for uh, a cure for dementia. Well, let's have a look at the research behind that. And that was undertaken at Parliament Hill Lido, which is this picture here that you can see on your screen. And what the, the group did is they had a group of outdoor swimmers that swam in this Lido and they compared them to a Tai Chi class that used to just uh, do their class on the deck uh, of this very same swimming pool. Now they compared them for, uh, they compared them for RMB3 protein, which really it, uh, helps to reduce the neural degeneration, which may lead to conditions like dementia. And they found in the outdoor swimmers that they had elevated levels of these RMB3 proteins. Now, they're not suggesting, therefore, that we should uh, immediately find uh, people living with dementia and put them in cold water. What they're suggesting, though, is that we find the potential causes of this potential therapeutic effect. And not just for dementia, but for every other condition we think may have therapeutic effect. Let's have a look at the potential causes or mechanisms. How long should that immersion be? How uh, should, does that... Um, does that immersion cause physiological changes that you can see here in blue that may impact or have therapeutic effect? Is the therapeutic effect as a consequence of a psychological cause due to just being in nature, having that element of challenge or achievement, or is it related to uh, the social groups uh, that are formed as a consequence of the activity that people are taking part in? So we're really at the dawn of uh, potential research for a therapeutic effect. And yes, we need to address the risks, but we also need to address and have more research to find definitive evidence that outdoor swimming may have. Who has the effect? Uh, what is the effect? What mechanisms or causes are there for that effect? And how do we exploit that uh, pathway or that therapeutic effect so that those who are not able to get into cold water are able to have that therapeutic opportunity. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Heather. And um, yeah, I, I I just love hearing that talk. I heard some of it on, on a previous webinar that you did. And I, I just think um, that the high that I get for the day, I literally, I'm in the car and I'm dancing to every record on the radio and just smiling for the whole day. And it really has, kept me sane as I've said said earlier it really I think without the winter swimming I really would have uh, really would have lost it this winter I think I think it's such a hard position for all of us to be in um, and we've all got to do what we what we need to do um, and we've got some great questions and comments coming up um, but I'd love now to move on to uh, Rachel uh, Rachel Ash I first heard Rachel speak at a Sheffield uh, Open Water Swimmers, they did a wonderful series on a Monday evening. Uh, I think they did four or five sessions. 
um, and they they talked about many things about swimming in reservoirs, about trespassing, um, and the uh, Black Swimming Group talked about um, their experiences with open water swimming, which was really important. And Heather did a whole session on her work. She is founder for Mental Health Swims, a community that empowers people of all body shapes, age, color, background, gender, sexuality, and ability. And it's a really wonderful work. So I'm really looking forward for you all to hear about Rachel's work on mental health swims. So I'll hand over to you, Rachel. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> so um, yeah, I'm Rachel Ash and I founded Mental Health Swims, um, which is a large, well, is a large community now of um, swimmers across the UK. Um, so, hold on, I'll just click on this. Um, I was thinking about International Women's Day and kind of how I think we are part of a long line of women who have been trying to make changes in the world. And how, as a person who has always felt that they don't fit in, I am adopted and I'm mixed race, I am queer, I'm also fat <laughs> and um, I have a really stigmatized mental illness, which means I, I really know what it feels like to not fit in. And um, in 2019, on New Year's Day, I was staying with my parents. Um, it wasn't that long after getting my diagnosis, which is quite complex. It was quite difficult to come to terms with and I was on medication which had horrible side effects. Um, the side effects were so bad that I was on sedatives in the day, I was taking sleeping pills at night and I was sort of often on the edge of psychoses which wasn't a lot of fun. Um, but my parents live in Edinburgh and they live in Portobello um, where there is a New Year's Day dip called the Looney Duke and that day I have no idea why, when I was feeling that ill, why I went and um, joined them, but I, um, I did join and I went down into the sea, even though I felt terrified that someone might talk to me and um, feeling just horrendous. And um, I ran into the sea with all of these other people and I was only in there probably a minute and it was bloody freezing and totally against all of the safety rules. I hadn't done any research. I wish I had had all your expert opinions before, um, but I did, I got in the sea and it took a couple of minutes afterwards, but um, now I understand that my um, natural painkillers had just kicked in and I felt this incredible calm that I hadn't felt in years and it was a life-changing moment. Um, so I promised myself that I would swim every month that year and I did. Um, and in the September, I put a shout out online asking if anyone would like to come and um, join me for a swim. Um, and I really bigged up that it was gonna be a welcoming space. I. Um, said that people were welcome however they were feeling. And I think that year was, I really sort of um, came out <laughs> as being someone who lives with quite a serious mental illness. And um, I think that was my own way of taking up space, of saying, this is who I am. And I don't want to be ashamed of it. I want to find people who are like me. Um, and I think that, was what really showed me anyway, that I am stronger than I think. So the day that I um, had invited everyone, like nearly 30 people came um, and it was amazing. We did it every month uh, until lockdown. And during lockdown, we did Zoom swims and something about it sparked a fire in me. Um, and Mental Health Swims was born. 
So we're all about making welcoming and inclusive spaces. Um, during lockdown, we grew from having one swim to now, um, less than a year later, having 80 across the UK. One in Australia too, which I think is really cool, and some in Ireland as well. Um, we are trying to remove the barriers that people experience. We want our spaces to be like, we want our meets to be welcoming for everyone. Um, and that just at the moment, <laughs> even though outdoor swimming is really inclusive for people of different body shapes, it's still a very white sport. I want to say sport loosely because mostly um, I do dipping, <laughs> but um, it's mostly white people. Um, I'm mixed race, but as a very, like, as you can see, quite pale mixed race person, um, even still, I am often the only brown person at a swim. Um, and I really want to challenge that. Um, so we're doing that through a few ways. We are telling stories. We have a great inclusivity advocate. She is currently um, interviewing people from all sorts of marginalized groups and finding out what it is about them that makes them love swimming and outdoor. For me, I think a huge part of it is that gyms are scary. Swimming pools for me are scary. If I get too hot somewhere, that can like trigger a massive panic attack. So being outside, being in the fresh air already limits those sort of triggers. Um, I think when we talk about accessibility, I want anyone from any budget, you know, anyone who, who lives on any sort of budget to be able to come along. We're working on trying to make sure that all of our swim hosts in each location um, has a flask because not everyone has a flask at home. Not everyone has a swimming costume. So I say, if you wanna wear leggings and a t-shirt, you can wear leggings and a t-shirt. Um, another barrier that people have is like, actually going to a group, it can be really scary. So um, we always have a giant pink pirate flag, like you can see in the picture. Um, this is so that people can find us on the beach. We use what three words, because the last thing you want to do when you're living with mental health challenges is go down on a beach and ask groups of people if they're in the mental health group that they want to join. Um, we are trying to, we're trying to make it easier for people to come to these groups. Um, we at the moment are talking with Swim England and um, we sort of partnered up with Mind Charity. We're trying to get uh, lifeguards at all of our swims because we want to be able to be um, as attractive as possible to social prescribing so that people can come straight from their GP. Because when you're using just social media to advertise your swims, you are relying just on the pool of people who use your social media. So at the moment, like the majority of people who are following mental health swims on Instagram are white and generally probably quite white and middle class as well. So by putting things in place, putting these safety things in place, by making sure that there's enough people there to support, to welcome people, to ensure that they're, they're okay and having a great time, means that we open it up to people who might not otherwise have chosen to do cold water swimming. We welcome people who even just want to have a paddle as well. Um, so what is the answer to making spaces that are more inclusive? This is a question I've been talking to organizations about a lot recently, and there isn't an easy answer. I think the really terrible thing is like all of the amazing women who've come before us who have fought to be in spaces where they weren't welcome. It's the same for people who are from marginalized groups and it seems incredibly unfair. I never thought that I would be welcome in these outdoor spaces. It's why I don't go to swimming pools. It's why I don't go to gyms. Um, I thought that living with mental illness meant that I would be better staying at home and hiding. Um, and I think the thing I want to say to all of you is if you're afraid 
to be places. I think taking that step and going, taking up space, like going to places where people don't expect you to go, that shows others that they can do it too. And that's a really powerful thing. Um, I think sometimes we perceive our weaknesses, um, which actually, our perceived weaknesses can actually be strengths. I, part of my diagnosis is that um, I can be quite compulsive <laughs> and that's not always very safe. But when that compulsiveness is channeled into doing something that I really believe in, that I'm passionate about, it then actually becomes something really useful, something really powerful. Um, I think recently I've been telling myself that it's actually okay to be a difficult woman. It's okay to speak up. I may not have the, the education that I need to be, so that I should probably have to be saying these things, but I think we all have a right to speak. Um, something I say to myself every day, and it's kind of a difficult one sometimes, because I don't always believe it, is that I'm allowed, that I am allowed to share how I feel, that I am allowed to turn up even if my mental health is not great right now, that I am allowed to tell you how, what I think of your ideas, I'm allowed to be here. And I think it's really important you know that so are you. You were also allowed. And I think that we are stronger than we think, even if it feels really scary. Thank you. Rachel, that, that was absolutely stunning, really, really. And um, when you gave your talk last time, for the Sheffield group, I, I was in tears and you are absolutely inspiring. There's so many comments um, in, the, in the chat about how amazing you are. And um, we had a International Women's Day session earlier today called Race and Reproduction, um, where we talked to a number of women from different minority cultures about the issues. And one thing we were discussing was um, seeing someone in a situation who looks like you and that maybe you might be in a fertility clinic waiting room and you don't see anyone else that looks like you or you know we're all different places and i think you, you've really mentioned that in your talk that if you go open water swimming and you don't see anyone that looks like you it, it can be a bit daunting and you are really a person who's leading this to to get more diversity and inclusion. And I think it's a really great community. You know, everyone would, would be really inclusive, but it's getting those, getting people there and getting them the um, encouragement to do that. And you really are leading on that. And, and for people with mental health issues as well. It's, I just love, love, love. Everyone love, love, loves. What the, the, the chat's gone mad with all these wonderful comments. So uh, please, please read them. So we have got lots of questions and things, but um, I'm going to move on to our last speaker. And it's a real pleasure to introduce Jessica Hepburn. Uh, Jessica and I met many years ago and she's been really, really inspirational to me. She's a fertility advocate and founder of um, a group that I'm sure she's going to tell you about, Fertility Fest, which is a, um, a collection of different events where Jessica and her and Gabby, her co-hosts, get together fertility experts and artists who work around fertility and infertility. And Jessica is going to tell you her experience of swimming the channel. And she's author of a book, which I hope, hope she mentions about her experience of swimming the channel. And she's going to tell you why she swam the channel. And it, the book is called 21 Miles. And I cried many times through it and just loved her even more after I'd read her book. So I'll hand over to Jessica to tell you about it. And I hope she also tells you about what she's planning to do at the moment what she's been training for so Jessica I'll hand over to you. Thank you so much Joyce I think following that introduction and Rachel is like pretty impossible um but uh I will try hi is that John I say into the receiver yes I found your details on the internet I was wondering whether you might be able to help me I'll try, he says gamely. 
His voice is positively plummy. I take a moment before speaking. I think I want to swim the English Channel. Do you, he says. What makes you think that? It's a childhood dream, turn midlife crisis. He chuckles. If you don't mind me asking, how old are you? 43. And are you a swimmer? Well, I can swim. I wouldn't call myself a swimmer. Did you swim competitively as a child for your county or a club? No. Have you ever done any open water swimming before? No. Well, how many times a week do you swim? I pause, wondering whether this is the sort of moment that justifies a fib. I don't want him to write me off already, but since I started trying to get pregnant, I've all but given up exercise. There's a theory that doing too much isn't helpful when you're trying to conceive. And whilst I don't think this means you're supposed to abandon it altogether up against all the other things you're told to give up, alcohol, coffee, etc., this wasn't a hard one for me. In fact, it was really rather easy. I've never been very good at sport. And the only thing I really like about exercise is feeling virtuous when it's over. At school, I was the sort of person who had to suffer the ignominy of being last to be picked for the rounders team. But I did enjoy swimming when I was a child and not just because we always went to McDonald's on the way home. For years, I attended a swimming class on a Wednesday night at the Prince of Wales Road Baths in Kentish Town. The instructor, Max, in his black trope, trunks and red terry toweling t-shirt would line us up all in the pool in speed order. I was always towards the back. Everyone used to joke that my best stroke was breaststroke legs. Then one day when I didn't get into the school swimming team again, I found myself consoling my dad. It was always harder managing his disappointment than my own. So I told him that it didn't matter that I hadn't got in because one day, I was going to swim the channel instead. I think I must have read about someone doing it in a newspaper and I figured you didn't need to be fast to swim all the way to France. You just needed to be able to keep going. And I've always been good at keeping going. That's probably why I've done 11 rounds of IVF. Yes, that's right, 11. I didn't want to mention the number before because I thought it might appall you. So I'm Jessica Hepburn, author, arts producer, and adventure activist. And that was a short passage from my book, 21 Miles, which is about how age 43, after a decade of unsuccessful IVF and multiple pregnancy losses, I decided I needed to do something different. I decided I needed to swim the English Channel. But at the start, I had no idea what was involved. I wasn't a very good swimmer. As I said, I hated exercise, still do, and the cold. But the one redeeming thing I did discover was that swimming the channel is a license to eat, and I love food. That's because you can't wear a wetsuit if you want to be an official channel swimmer because Captain Matthew Webb, who first swam the channel in 1875, didn't wear a wetsuit, so you can't today. The only way to keep out the cold is a bit of human padding. So I decided that I was going to write to 21 famous and inspirational women and ask them whether they would meet and eat with me to help me get fat, to swim the channel and answer the question, does motherhood make you happy? And 21 Miles, my book, is the story of that journey. Now, you'll have to read the book to find out the answer to that question, if you're interested. But one thing that I did learn is that while swimming, whether you swim for five minutes or 17 hours, 44 minutes and 30 seconds, there's a spoiler, um, can change your day for the better. And sometimes it can even change your life. It changed my life. And although I think I will always be an unlikely athlete, this year, I hope to fly out to Nepal, postponed from last year due to COVID, 
to try and become the first woman to complete the Pond to Peak Challenge, which is to swim the English Channel and then climb Mount Everest. So far, only completed by a handful of men, which is my contribution to International Women's Day today. But in the end, I know that whether I get there or not will be down to another woman. And that woman is Mother Nature because she decides whether you can swim her seas or climb her mountains or conceive and carry a baby to term. And that is perhaps the most important lesson that swimming in open water has ever taught me. And I love her for teaching me it because it is a constant reminder that there is something so much bigger and more important in the world than just me. And that is the mountains and the sea. Thank you. Jessica, thank you. I think that was such a lovely way to end our panel discussion today. It's, it's been really um, heartwarming to hear from everybody. So we have got lots of questions. There's been so many comments in the chat, I've actually lost count. Um, one thing I wanted to, to mention, some people mentioned in the, in the chat much earlier, um, there were some comments about things like underwear. Um, I don't know about the other women, but um, I know some women do put their bra on, but um, which of you out there, you can put it on the chat. Do, I don't bother with the bra or the underwear. <laughs> When I after I've after I've swum, I just get some hoodie on and some joggers and go home. And it's uh, I just I love not wearing a bra and underwear. So I thought I thought we'd start with a bit of fun about the you know nitty gritty practical things. Um, but there was a, there was a discussion. Um, some people wrote about cake, and um, I had an experience the other day. We did a full moon swim. And uh, I got the coldest I've ever been. And I didn't have a wetsuit on. I did have some leggings and things on, but not a wetsuit. And um, I think I think from reading up about it was, my problem was I hadn't eaten for six hours. And then I didn't eat till I got, quite a long time till I got home. And um, I'd, I'd like to ask um, Heather and Ruth, is, one of, is cake a good idea? Because it's reloading your glycogen stores. And that actually, that, is it just a, is it just not true or make us all, hopefully you're gonna make us feel better that eat, eating cake will help warm up your body quicker. <laughs> Taking uh, Jessica's comment about eating with, with women. Does, does eating cake have any real health benefits after a swim or is it just in our head? I think, I think it does. Uh, my mum uh, was a cookery teacher. So uh, cake has always been a big part of my life. Um, I have many aunties in Yorkshire and it was death by cake at half term when we toured Yorkshire and had cake at 11, 12, 3 and 5 o'clock in the afternoon. So I am a girl of cake, quite how I don't have diabetes, I don't know. I believe that it does. I think um, putting your glucose levels up a bit uh, helps with rewarming. The, uh, the shivering response that you get is one of the most effective ways of burning energy. So uh, it generates a lot of heat inside the body and that energy to generate that heat needs to come from somewhere and glucose in cake is a really good way to do it. And it tastes nice. There are <laughs> lots of great swimming cakes. And on another day, I'll give you my talk uh, illustrated by cake of various open water swimming pathologies. You've made us all very happy. Thank you. I must admit, I have, I'm I'm on a no processed sugar diet, so I actually haven't. I know once, like once someone gave me, once my friend Vicky gave me some cake, and I did enjoy it. But yeah, I do I do wonder about that day when I just hadn't eaten enough. Um, Rachel, there was a question for you about to tell us more about your what's a Zoom swim? Somebody said. <laughs> um, it's just when you have like a paddling pool or a bucket of water in your garden, but you do it together on zoom it's it was just a way of getting through that first lockdown um i think probably a lot of you found that uh if your mental health wasn't always that great it deteriorated quite rapidly um i think the best of us uh were struggling so yes it was just um a bit of cold water dunking in company yeah <laughs> 
I did wonder whether you were sitting in your lounges with just with your swimming costumes on. But yeah, that no, that's so dunking in the garden and just being careful not to drop your phone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, there was another physiological question about the best way to measure your core temperature. So I don't know whether uh, Ruth and, or Heather want to say that. Is that something we probably can't do at home or is it something we can do at home? I could think of some. I think, I think Ruth's going to leave that one for me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Heather. Yes, yeah, no problem. Um, the most accurate way of measuring deep body temperature for a swimmer unfortunately is uh, via the rectum as I'm sure many of you knew what was coming um, because many of the other measures that are used for instance the uh, the ear probe that's used quite frequently with uh, with uh, children that will give you really inaccurate results um, so yeah I, I'm not convinced it's exactly a suitable measure for home but often used in uh, research facilities or in hospitals yeah, I don't, I, that might not appeal to so many people. So. And Ruth's <laughs> demonstrating a rectal <laughs> probe right now. <laughs> we don't need to see any more, though. <laughs> I, don't, I, I, I don't think she wants to show you any more. <laughs> um, so just taking up Jessica's uh, wonderful talk about how she, so I've, I've known Jessica, I met Jessica just probably just about the time when she was doing the swim and that didn't really know what she was doing at the time till I read her book and and understood what she went through um really not being a swimmer or a strong swimmer and in the book you'll if anyone reads the book um it is it is amazing about perseverance because so many people told Jessica along the way you're not going to be able to do it you're not the right person it's you know it's a really really hard challenge and and you know you've really given it away Jessica you did do it which was absolutely uh, amazing um and with taking up rachel's um talk as well um did, did did anyone else want to say anything about how they're using open water swimming to get over um mental health issues and physical health issues so i know we've got kathleen on on board and i'm welcoming kathleen to to unmute so kathleen if you're on any, on any of the social media or facebook you probably would have seen Kathleen. She's been blogging about her health journey. Um, is she still on? I am. I, oh, there's Kathleen. Hello. Yeah, Hi, Kathleen, everybody. tell us about your journey. Hi, um, well, I'm a single mum who got grown up children and a grandmum. I'm 48 year old and I've got quite a few health conditions. I have osteoarthritis, fibromyalgia, lipidemia, Oh, hang on, chronic asthma and severe hypermobility. And last year during lockdown, I'd gone from volunteering because I've got I've also got a um, degree in public health, but I haven't been able to take up because my back went beforehand. But quickly back to where I was. Lockdown, the first lockdown, I'd stop getting out, I'd stop moving, and I'd literally became unable to get off the chair on my own. I couldn't put my own shoes on, and I physically give up on my life. I'd put that much weight on. And I just thought there's no way I can, there's no way out of this. Absolutely possible unless I go the, ga the gastric bypass, which I did not want to do, go down that route. That was personal choice, but I would have if I had to. Then I saw my sisters swimming in the sea, and I love the sea. I grew up swimming in the sea. We had no water swimming pool. It was the Olympic size. It was pit baths. So when I was younger, I was an open water swimmer, which I didn't realise. <laughs> um, and I went, I want to do it. And they were like, no, you they were like yeah yeah do it I said no I can't I can't move I can't get down them steps I can't go on that bridge I can't do it and I went just come so a lot of persuasion I got up I got dressed and I went I fell over on the beach I don't know how many times I flashed a moon to the, the fisherman on the pier so lovely then and I eventually got in that water and oh my goodness I felt like there was with a five my elder sometimes I feel clogged head and I felt like the fog just lifted. I was not in pain and I could move. And I just felt on top of the world. And then it was the problem, which this is where it gets a bit interesting. I was going in in my army. You talked about clothing earlier, underwear, swimwear, underwear, bra and pants, leggings, swim costume, top, you name it. I was wearing it. But I couldn't change. Because of my mobility was so poor, I could not change. I was going home in all them wet clothes every swim. 
and I was struggling to warm up. So with a lot of persuasion, I started delaying, I suppose, taking a bit off at a time. And each time I didn't want to do it, but each time I was nagged up by me two very persuasive sisters. I'm one of eight, by the way, they're just two of them. So what I was like, so I did that. And then eventually I ended up in a bikini. And they took photos, asked me to post them, no chance. I'll pop my legs off because the lipidemia. I don't know if people know about lipidemia, but it's where the fat cells tell fine. It gives you a sort of a look of a melted candle. And it's mainly at the bottom half of the body and sometimes the arms. So they were like, don't, don't. And I, and I did do it. And I posted in a little swim group where I swim, which was great. And then during the night, because I can't see I'm squinting, I'm going like this. Oh, that's all right. It's only got about 54 people in. I didn't realise there up more. Swimming had 54,000 people in. <laughs> so I posted in there. <laughs> I'd walk up to like a crazy fog sound on my phone, but oh my goodness. <laughs> so it was so overwhelming. And then I realised because of all the positive comments that I could use this to my advantage because I'll, I've always been interested in health. I've always promoted health. I've, even though I've had poor health myself, I've always worked with people and I do a lot of them. Um, I teach crafts now online and I also do a singing group as well on Zoom and stuff just to keep yourself busy. And I just can't believe the difference. I now can get up the stairs. I don't use my sticks in the house at all. I can walk short distances without my sticks all of a sudden. Um, I can lift my feet, which I thought was amazing because I've dragged my feet for years. I can walk lift my feet. I was practically bouncing. So that meant I can jump the waves, you see. So it's just been an amazing journey. And the amount of people that's messages and, the, and for help or support or just asking questions and about open water swimming and or saying I've like made them the best the best thing they could possibly do in the back and exercising because they saw my struggles and they thought why am I sitting on the sofa doing nothing so that's just going through really quick I've got so much more of a story but I don't want to plug up the whole thing so that's me Thank you so much. So please, I know she's wonderful. Please follow her. Please follow her on. You'll see her on the swimming groups. And I was so pleased when you came on when I when I opened up the the Zoom tonight. There you are. I was like, wow, brilliant. I went to do it, and then I forgot because I'd gone swimming. I could, and then I got an email on. And I was looking on my room. Oh, I forgot about that. I better have you up and get home. <laughs> no, thank you so much because I think one of the key things that we've seen from people like Jessica, well, everyone, every, all of our speakers is and and Rachel. You know the the inspiration that all of these women yeah. are on International Women's Day really so important you're just all so inspirational and every woman I go with inspires me and they push me a bit further and and it's it's just so so good for our mental and physical it's health a beautiful community the swimming community it has blown me away really has it's give us faith in humanity again what more can you ask for <laughs> it really has and during this really difficult year I think that's that's really amazing um, going back to some other more questions. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Thank you. You're very for your welcome. Time. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Oh, it's a pleasure, real pleasure. Um, we've got uh, a couple of practical questions. Um, one person said about um, drowning. Um, in the summer, we're going to have lots of reeds and um, other things in the water. Um, so I don't know which who who wanted to uh, talk about this. Maybe even Sasha or Ruth. Um, do, do we have to be careful of getting tangled in sort of nature as well about what, what might be in that water that could cause a problem or is it is it unlikely I don't know which one one of you or, or, or Heather yeah yeah I, I think it's unlikely um, I, I did I posted something in the chat that obviously I stole from someone else because I have no original thoughts but uh, the Outdoor Swimming Society has got a little page on what to do if you get caught in the weeds. And it's all about kind of, as with everything in, in water, the more relaxed you are, the safer you are usually. Uh, and it's about not, not trying to avoid using breaststroke and swimming gently. Heather's got her hand up. She's a much better swimmer than I am. I'll let her speak. 
think Ruth nearly Ruth got there with the answer. I was just going to say, don't panic, turn and float on your back and relax so that you're not entangling yourself any further. If you do feel that you are in weed, roll onto your back, adopt a star shape and someone will be able to come and find you and help you. Can I, can I just ask, and, um, this is just from my interest, so swans, there's always swans near us. The swans came right up to us today. <laughs> and um, so some of you might have heard in Cambridge, we did have an ASBO swan a few years ago who was always causing lots of trouble and attacking everybody. Um, I'm not sure what happened to the ASBO swan. I don't think it's there anymore. Well, all they're behaving. Um, and swans, I think we just have to be calm and sort of not panic again and move away. They're not gonna, they're not gonna eat us, <laughs> they might peck us. Generally, I think that birds are much more scared of us than we are of them. And, you know, I, I, swimming alongside the birds, I think is just amazing. Yeah. I don't think there's anything really to be scared of. I, I love seeing them there. And I always, I'm writing a journal, I'm sure many people are of, of my swims to remember, because I have a terrible memory. And I always put about which birds, normally it's just some ducks, but today the swan, one of the swans came literally up to the, the stairs where we get in. Um, and now another practical question. Um, someone's asked, is swimming in a swimming pool, uh, does it have as many health benefits as open water swimming? I, th I think from all the speakers, from what you've said, the, the, the short answer will be no. <laughs> but um, I think, you know, getting out to nature, being in colder water, et cetera. But um, does anyone want to add anything to that, comparing a swimming pool to the open water? I don't think there's much evident, a huge amount of evidence to compare open water with pool swimming, but it, it may be that it, it just interests a different group of people. And some people prefer to be outside swimming. Some people prefer to be inside swimming. It's all about what interests you the most. Yeah, um, and so my son today said, so when the pool opens again, are you going to go, I assume you're going to go back in it and stop this open water swimming. So no, I'm going to make him listen to Sasha's talk. <laughs> say, look, this is a professor from UCL. So listen, listen to what, uh, what she's got to say. Now we have got so many, there's 99 more comments since I last looked. Um, so we've got about eight minutes left. So, wow, I've just, I'll, I'll try and look through. So, well, I'll just confirm something. And then I think what we'll do is we'll just let um, all the speakers just do a little bit of a summing up. Um, so I, I run a, just a public facing website called Global Women Connected. And I have on there already a post about this evening. So I will go through all the links and things people have posted and, um, and books, et cetera, that people have mentioned. And um, I will also, the, the, the video will be on YouTube by tomorrow. Uh, they are, the, uh, my Wi-Fi has been really slow. It's taken uh, about three hours for the one from lunchtime to, to download onto YouTube, but it should be there by tomorrow. So I'll put the link on Global Women Connected. It will be on my uh, Joyce Harper YouTube channel. Um, so you can listen to it again. Um, take some more notes and, and uh, anything you want from there. But there's been so much really useful information that it's a real pleasure um, for our speakers to be here. And I will um, also post the YouTube link on all the main Facebook groups. I'm on quite a few of uh, the big UK ones. Um, so I'll post the link on there as well, just to the YouTube video so that people can watch it. Um, so I just, I just love it if our speakers now, we've got few minutes left um just if there was anything else that they wanted to add it, I, I mean I've learned so much uh from this session it's been really really amazing um so Sasha is there anything you wanted to say to conclude well I'd just like to say what an amazing array of speakers you've gathered here Joyce what a fantastic evening and and I'm absolutely confirmed in my belief that open water swimming for women is a social movement Wonderfully put, wonderfully put. And uh, Ruth. Um, thank you. I'm so honoured to be in this company. Uh, what I would say is it's it's our lovely environment. Pick up some litter every time you go swimming and know that you've gained something positive and you've done something positive. And uh, small positive acts can sometimes help your mental health as well. 
And eat cake. <laughs> and eat cake. Always cake. Uh, there's always cake if you swim with me. I'm going to remember that, Ruth. <laughs> um, and I, I'd love to swim with everyone who's on here at some point in the, in the coming year. Um, Heather. Um, I think, yeah, I echo eat cake. Uh, but definitely <laughs> remember this is something that we really enjoy doing. And um, just embrace that moment. And it's something that 100 years ago and even more, people used to do a lot more. And then with leisure centres and indoor swimming pools, we, we moved indoors. And it, it's one of those mad things that we are surrounded by derelict swimming pools um, from, you know, 70, 80 years ago that and uh, outdoor, outdoor swimming pools and, um, you know, other wonderful areas that went into the river in Cambridge. There's lots of historical areas where students swam. And, and it's and uh, anyway, so it's great. It's coming back. I think it's great. It's coming back. Thank you very much, Heather and Rachel. Um, nothing really to say, but thank you very much for having me. And um, yeah, <laughs> I hope we get to all swim together at some point. <laughs> oh, we're, we're all going to get to swim together. I really, really hope. Thank you so much, Rachel. And we hope that Mental Health Swims grows from strength to strength. And I know that you're going to feel the love from you know all the benefits you are providing to people. and and getting that movement going. So well done on, on all your work. It's really amazing. And last but not least, she's been last before, but not. Uh, yeah, well, well, Joyce, I've been thinking like, if you were a body of water, what body of water are you? And I think you are a waterfall and you are so bubbly and joyous and a, a total force of nature and thank you so much on behalf of all of us that have been here tonight for putting this together you are incredible thank you jessica we, we have a mutual love me and jessica i think she's amazing and just in the last minute i've got the last poll just to get the bit of feedback so did you find this event useful yes no or not sure I think we're going to see. Oh, it's going up really quickly. And we could all go and watch uh, Megan after this. <laughs> Not like the people that did. So that was really, really quick. We've got 77, 78% of people voted now. So I'll just give it a few more minutes. We've got, and if you want to have a look, what's, have any comments in the chat? There's one comment just coming in about the Obesity Society and everything lots of things coming on so i'm just going to stop and share the results so 99 there's only one person who said they weren't sure but 99 percent of people it's always one <laughs> it's fine that's fine 99 percent of people said they found this event really useful well, useful so thank you so much we've actually ended we've just got a couple of minutes left um what i would just ask can the panel just stay on um, when everyone else has clicked off? Um, I just want to try and do a group photo of us, um, but because we haven't set up in a webinar, it hasn't sort of shown. So I'm just going to press stop recording. <laughs>